Hello, and welcome to our Surge Experience Online. It is a joy to have you join us today and an honor to share our ministry with you. We pray you will be blessed by the worship, the message, and the ministry. If you are new to Surge, we want to welcome you. Please log on to our website at surgechurch.tv and complete the online connect card that you will find on the main graphic of the homepage. It will be a privilege to connect with you and to be a part of your spiritual growth. As we gather together today, let's join in worship, receive God's word in faith, and stay connected in spirit. Get ready because the Surge Experience starts now. Give God a hand clap before you sit down. Just praise Him. Didn't we have great worship today? Like, it was great. It was, man, it's just, every time I hear that, like, I get excited about that, and I, I get excited about giving, too, as well. I really do. I get excited. Like, anyone get excited about giving? 
You ever remember, like, like me, I remember when I was a kid, used to remember as a kid, used to love getting, getting a gift. You know, then you get a little older and then you love giving the gift. You have grandchildren, you have kids, or you have something, it's actually more excitement now giving, watching someone open up what you gave them versus getting something now. Maybe it's just you get older and you got everything you need. I don't know. Or maybe it's, but it's, it's you maturing as, as a person, as a Christian. When you start seeing you know, your fruits, you start seeing you know, what's happening, right? So I want to talk to you guys about tithing just, just for a minute, okay? I'm going to take a few minutes of your time. And how many of you guys know the word tithing means a tenth? It's a real simple translation. just means a tenth, right? But as followers, you know, as followers of Jesus, sometimes we use that as our, uh, you know, we say, okay, oh, I tithe. But guess what? Tithe is, is a minimum, all right? Not a maximum of giving, all right? It's not a maximum of giving. I told the story before, uh, when, I, when I first become a Christian, okay, I didn't know what tithing was. I was going to church and didn't know what tithing was. I didn't know it meant a tenth, okay? And then I, then I started to develop, when I found out what it was, I was like, oh, that's just Old Testament, all right? I had that in my mind. Someone, someone put that in my mind, but guess what? It's not Old Testament, all right? It's New Testament. In Matthew 23, 23, it says, he actually corrected, I'm not gonna read the verse, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. He corrected the Pharisees of how they were tithing. And he redirects them of what they should do with their tithe instead. All right, that's Jesus himself, that's New Testament. He's telling them, hey, guess what? Yeah, you're walking around saying, I gave this, I gave that, but guess what? You're not doing it right because it's supposed to be about a generous heart, a generous heart, all right? So by doing this, we can clearly see that it is a New Testament, uh, New Testament principle along with an Old Testament, right? But Jesus validates this. He just validated it straight up. He just said, okay, guess what? You know, generosity is present when tithing, not selfish motivations. Church has turned into, hey, I tithe. I should be able to pick out the music I like. I tithe, I should be able to do this. I tithe, I don't like the way the chairs are. I tithe, guess what? That's not what God says what tithing is, all right? It's out of a generous heart, all right? So we shouldn't be, we shouldn't just give our 10th and say, I'm done. Example after example in the Bible shows that Jesus raised the bar. Jesus raised the bar, right? He raised the bar over and over and over again. And like you take Matthew 5, chapter 5, 6, and 7, he compares hatred to like murder. It's raising the bar, right? He says if you hate someone, it's like committing murder, right? He also says, you know, lusting over someone is adultery. It's raising the bar. Jesus is showing us that we need to raise the bar. All right, our tithe goes to our local church. That's what the Bible says, right? And a church takes that tithe and accomplishes the goals or the vision that God has given them. That's what the tithes are for. But I just want to get a reminder that Christians are called to be a part of a local body. We're called to be, okay? We're, we're not, only, not only that, we all have roles to play at church. We all have roles, right? Community is a command. We're commanded to be part of a body, to be part of a community, right? And it's not just a suggestion. A lot of us take it as a suggestion, but it's a command. Right? We are called to be in a community with others, not just to live in isolation. Not to just give, I, I'm gonna go ahead and give a little and walk away, we're good. No, let's raise the bar. Let's show others, what's the difference between us and others? Is our heart how we give, right? If we believe that God is who he says he is and we are who he says we are, we do what he tells us to do. And he tells us to give. It's in the Bible more than the word love. You guys know that? Some form of give. You got give, giveth, given, all the other ones, right? It's actually in the Bible a lot. It's very important, right? Why is it important? Because God says it's important. So I just encourage you guys today to, to give. As the ushers come up front uh, to collect the offering, uh, for those of you online, you can go online or do the Surge app. You can go ahead and give that way. There's plenty of ways that are going to flash on your screen. But I just encourage you guys today to, to raise the bar. Raise the bar in your giving. Raise the bar in your believing, your faith. Everything you do, raise the bar. You know, we're not perfect, right? I hate, uh, I'm not a big fan of, of, of expressions, like no one's perfect but Jesus. That is true, but guess what? I'm gonna try to be perfect every day. Every day I wake up, today's gonna be the day I'll be perfect. I haven't accomplished it yet, but I'm still trying, right? I'm still trying every day. Don't give up, don't give up, and just raise the bar. I'm gonna go ahead and pray, and then I'll pass the buckets out. And just Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, we thank you for who you are, Lord. 
Lord, you are who you say you are, and we believe it. We stand in your word today. Your word says that two or more gather in your name. You are here, and we believe that you're here right now. Lord, we ask you to touch our, touch our finances, Lord, and I ask you to touch our situation, whatever that situation is, Lord, as we give to you what is yours, Lord, and we, and we just have a, just ask you to bless our heart, bless everything we touch, Lord, because you, that's who you are. Lord, I just lift you up today. Lord, I give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you as you give. Amen, amen. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm so excited this morning for the opportunity just to share uh, what the Lord's put on my heart. Man, I, I enjoy uh, doing this. I, I'm so thankful for Pastor Brad and Pastor Mary and allowing me to do this for them sometimes as he travels and things like that. Um, so I'm happy to be with you guys this morning. Thank you for being here. Um, man, I, I love this church, man. I love um, just what's going on here. I think great things are in store very soon um, for the church in general all around the world and in this nation and, and here in the city and here at Surge Church, man. I believe uh, God's got powerful things in store. Amen. Well, this morning before I jump in, I'm just going to pray and ask the Lord just to be with us for the next few moments. Um, uh, shouldn't be too long this morning, uh, so hopefully we'll get out of here early. Um, but Father, I just thank you, God, this morning. Lord, I thank you for every person in this place. God, I thank you, Lord, that uh, it's not coincidence that we are here. Lord, it is an appointed time just to be in your presence. God, I thank you for amazing worship, Lord, that we just get to come and exalt you. God, I thank you, God, that we have a place that we can come and exalt you, Lord. In other countries right now, Lord, as um, God, things are um, looking like they're falling apart for the church, Lord. I just thank you that we are so blessed in this country to be able to come and praise you and worship you, God, and exalt you and dance before you, Lord. I just thank you, God, for that, uh, that, that opportunity, God, it's such an amazing time, Lord, to give back to you with our praise and our worship. God, I pray for the next few moments, Lord, that you open up every heart in this room for what you have to say. God, you uh, open up every mind. Let us focus on your word, God. Uh, let it be your words and not mine. Speak to your people today, God. And let us leave here different than we came. Lord, I thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and everything you've done. In Jesus' mighty name, everyone said amen and amen. Um, you know, Kristen and I, our, kind of our big thing in our life, like what we kind of like to do together is fish. Does anybody, anybody else kind of like that? We, we love to fish. We like to bass fish a lot. Um, our first date, we actually went fishing together. Uh, I worked on this farm um, down the road, not too far away. I work, worked on this farm, and, um, and I went and picked her up, and, um, you know, we kind of did all my little evening duties on the farm, fed all the horses and, and all the animals and put them up, and then uh, we went down to a pond on the farm. There's this, there, there's this big pond, and uh, it was a brim and bass pond, and I had all the little stuff laid out uh, for us there, and um, and, and I had a, heard a little rod there, you know, and had a little cork on it, a little hook, and, and some weenies there to catch some brim on, right? Then I had my rod, and it, you know, had a, had a trick worm on it, and can catch some bass. And so we went fishing that day. I remember about 15, 20 minutes go by, you know, I'm, I'm catching bass. You know, bass just a little bit more strategic than throwing a line out there with a cork on it. And um, I, I look over, and Kristen, she had been catching a few brim. I look over about 15, 20 minutes in, and, man, she done changed the hook out, put a trick worm on. She's over there teasing them. I'm like, that's when I knew. I was like, yeah. This is it, no. Um, but that, that was kind of always our thing. Um, we love to do that. We do that very often. And we have a pond out in uh, my father's house, and he's got a nice pond out there that we like to fish. And just the other day, um, and we went fishing, um, and most of my time, whenever we fish, is spent um, rigging up the rods because I break about 10 lines a day every time we go. I don't know why. It's just I, I literally break a line every time. And, uh, and so I'm tying up these knots, tying up these hooks and things like that. And um, I was joking with her. You know, now, nowadays you can just, like, buy pre-tied, like, hooks and stuff. Like, they come pre-tied already on the hook at Walmart. Like, you can literally buy them. They just have, like, a little attachment. You can just change them in and out. Like, you don't have to. Like, they literally come pre-tied, right? And I was messing with Kristen because it was, like, every 10 10 minutes go by and I'd break a line and literally she was catching like a hundred fish and I was just spent like all my time and I'd throw it out one cast, break the line. I was like, what in the world? But I was, I was tying these knots, right? And you know, there's a certain knot that you tie like with a hook in it and like a normal tie your shoe knot. It's a certain knot. And I was messing with Chris. And I was like, man, Walmart will buy these knots right here. Like your boy's bad. I can tie me a knot. Like it was real pretty. Like, I don't know. I'm weird. I enjoy this kind of thing. She's like, 
all right, good, have fun. <laughs> like, whatever, I'm just going to keep fishing. Uh, but I was messing with it. I was like, man, Walmart, I mean, I'm fixing to make a bunch of these go Walmart, but how much are you going to give me for this knot right here? Like, your boy's bad, all right? I can tie me a fishing knot. And, uh, but I was just joking with it, but I was just, you, when, I'm serious, when you looked at it, it was a nice knot. It wasn't coming undone. And, you know, when something is, is strongly tied, when something is strongly knit together, um, it's not easily broken, right? It's not, it's a bond that it, it's not going to come off easy. It's going to take some work to, to break that, right? And, you know, in life, I believe that God has called us to be successful, right? I believe he's called us to make an impact on the world. I don't believe he's just called us just to live life, you know, like everybody else. No, I believe, like, we are made by God. We serve God. And, and that reason, I think he has called us to be impactful people, to be successful people, to prosper, right? And, and one thing I've learned um, in my life is that that's not always super easy, right? That that's not the easiest thing in the world to do, that often there's a lot of uh, problems, a lot of hard things to do. But um, I believe that when we do that together, whenever we have people that we do that with, um, it, it becomes a lot easier, right? And so today I want to read in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 7. Uh, I'm going to be in the New King James Version. Um, it's also going to be on the screen behind me. Uh, but 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 7. It says, Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it had happened that as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Now, we've probably all, if you grew up in church, you've probably heard a hundred David uh, sermons, right? You've, you've probably heard so many stories or sermons about David. I'm sure we all have, but um, I, I feel this one has a little bit of twist on it here in just a minute that I, that I believe um, will uh, speak to every person in this room. So my title today is Not Letting Go, Not Letting Go, Not with a K, right? Like not, like you tie a knot. Some of y'all are like, yeah, okay, I get it now. It's getting there. It's getting there. Uh, not letting go. So the first thing we see here in this passage is the bond between Jonathan and David, the brotherhood between Jonathan and David that sparks um, here in this, in this, this, this short verse. Um, the Bible says, I love this word, it says they are knit together. You know, whenever I read scripture, whenever I'm studying, I try to find like key words like that, something that just sticks out that may be a little different than you don't see very often. And, and as I was reading, that knit kind of stuck out to me. So I, so I like to look up the meanings and find the original terms and stuff. So knit means to unite. To knit means to unite. In the Greek, they would use the word pleco. Pleco. That translates to intertwine or tie with a knot, pleco, to intertwine or tie with a knot, right? So I right hear David has just killed Goliath, okay? He was a shepherd, came to feed his brothers while they were in the war. And it gets there. We all know the story. Goliath, he, he's yelling. He's, um, you know, talking bad about God. David goes out there, kills the giant, cuts his head off, brings it back to uh, Saul's camp, and here it says that Saul brings him into the kingdom, does not let him return home to his father, and that him and Jonathan are now knit together, right? So uh, he's no longer a shepherd boy, but he went from a shepherd boy to now this war hero, like overnight, this success, right? And so now he's just not, he's not a little boy anymore. He's not a young kid anymore. He is now this big war hero uh, that slays giants. And it says that 
Saul took David into his kingdom, right? It says that David began to prosper under the king. David began to prosper. He began to grow. He began to do great things. And it says, I love this, that he went out and behaved wisely, that he behaved wisely. And that was something that stuck out to me, um, that, that he behaved wisely, that he was prospering and making right decisions. And I wanted to share this quote with you. Uh, it's by Arthur W. Pink. Arthur W. Pink, he's a great uh, Christian writer, leadership writer uh, from years and years ago. Uh, and man, he's wrote some great things, some great commentary in the Bible. Um, and if you enjoy that kind of stuff, commentaries, things like that, I encourage you to look up Arthur W. Pink and some of his work. It is amazing. He's probably my favorite. Uh, but I want to share this quote. It says, how many have through injudicious conduct not only hindered their spiritual progress, but ruined their earthly prospects? And, and, and when, I, when I read that by Arthur W. Pink, I thought of David. I thought of this, this time in David's life that was so important, that was so, um, man, I mean, I look at, I, I'm, a, I'm big on the young adult ministry. I'm big on like that age group, the, 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 the young adults just getting into um, adulthood because I, I believe that that is the more, most important age. I've got statistics that back that up that say, um, not even in the Christian span, but like in even the worldly, like that age is the most important because you make some big decisions in that age. And um, here, that's where David is. He's a young man. He's going from boyhood to manhood. And I think about how he went from a shepherd to just this war hero like that. You know, we see often like with athletes or stars or something like that who who they, they, they become like an overnight success, right? They blow up, especially nowadays it's easier. Like we see high schoolers who are 16, 17 years old and they're all over sports center, top prospects and things like that. Now they're getting deals in college. They can get more, a lot of money and things. And, and, and often we've seen that take a bad route, right? We've seen that take a route where people that get this money at an 18, 19, 20 years old uh, with these young athletes and stars and their life goes down a bad path because that brings in a lot more problems. And I think about David here. I'm thinking that, that it says that he behaved wisely, but in reality, when you look at that, that, that's easier said than done whenever you're David and you've been a shepherd this whole time. And all of a sudden, now you're this overnight success. You're this war hero. Everybody's singing about you. You're the king's prospering you, making you a military leader, all these things, right? And I want to read Isaiah 52, verse 13. It says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. That word prudently right there means to care and show thought for the future. In other words, if you behave wisely and God, uh, God can and will exalt you into higher positions for the opportunity of his good. As a young man, David behaved wisely. He was smart in his spirit. He was smart with his decisions. He was sm smart for what God had called him to do. He's behaving wisely, and God was able to prosper him. God was able to uh, propel him into his future, right, to his calling. We all know at this time he had already been an anointed king. As a young shepherd boy, youngest of all of his brothers, he was anointed king of Israel. And now we see that he is in the kingdom, right? You with me? No? <laughs> right? And so we see that Saul makes David one of his military officers because he had prospered and behaved wisely. You see, David's anointed as, anointing as king was already beginning to show as a young man. He had been anointed as king as a young boy, but now it had begun to show as a young man. You start seeing these things whenever you read the story, like, wow, things are starting to happen for him. Things are starting to come in place. Like, uh, he's in the kingdom now. He's a military. Like, you can see, kind of see the story building up, right? It's kind of like, uh, kind of like one of those things where you already know the ending. Like, you know he's going to become king because it happened way before when he was a shepherd boy. And now we kind of get to see it all unfold. We, we get to see how it happens. And, I man, can I encourage you? So many of us, when we talk about our anointing, our purpose in life, whatever it is, like it's like, okay, I got to get there, right? I got to get, I, I can tell you at, at a young uh, age as, as in a ministry, going into ministry, trying to get there, trying to get my purpose, trying to fulfill what God's called me to do, right? Out of a good heart, I probably made some wrong decisions, right? Because I'm like, oh, I got to get there. I got to get to my anointing. I got to get to my purpose. Can I encourage you? Your anointing is not for then. Your anointing is for now. Your anointing is not for when you make it. Your anointing is for right now where you are at. Your anointing, I love this, your anointing, it takes.
takes you to your life's purpose. Your life purpose doesn't take you to your anointing. Your anointing, it's what takes you to your life's purpose. So many times we get bogged down by life. We get bogged down by our purpose. We get bogged down because it's not easy fulfilling the purpose that God created for us. And we get bogged down by that. But I want to encourage you, your anointing, it doesn't, it doesn't wait. It, it is what gets you there. It's what takes you to your life's purpose. Ecclesiastes 9, 9 10 says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. I don't know where you're at right now. It may not be where you feel like you're supposed to be. It may not be where where you feel like you're called to be, where you feel like God has placed on your heart to do for him, for the kingdom. But I I just want to encourage you today, wherever you are, do it with all of your might because God has anointed you now. He's not waiting for you to get better. He's not waiting for you to get right. He's not waiting for you to just line up. No, he has anointed you now to do the work of the Father. Everywhere you go, not just in church, not just here, not just serving. That's great. That's that's biblical. That's needed. But out there, wherever you are, maybe you're a teenager uh, and you're in high school or, or you're, you are a young adult and you're in that big stage of your life or maybe you're older, you're in your workplace, whatever it is, you know people that don't know Christ are not serving Christ and God has called you there. God has called you to do that with all your might for him, to behave wisely in that and your anointing, man, that purpose on your life will begin to unfold as we see here in, as, as David. I love that David, think about it, David went from a shepherd, right? He was a shepherd boy, anointed as king, but still a shepherd. He stayed as a shepherd for a long time. And then the Bible talks about, we all know the story uh, that, that the Bible talks about Saul. He had, these demons begin to attack. He began to have terrors. And he asked, I need someone to come and play. Well, David was known for his skill. David was known. Like, they didn't just randomly, uh, like, send out, hey, somebody knows how to play the harp. They literally said, hey, we know this kid. Hold on. And they went and found this little shepherd boy that knew how to play the harp and brought him in to the kingdom. And now he went from being a shepherd boy to a harp player for the king. And it says, that when he played, the demons fleed Saul. So now he went from shepherd to this heart player for the king, and then he goes, uh, and now he's a giant slayer. Now he's, he's killed Goliath. Then he goes from giant slayer to member of the kingdom. It says that he brought him into his kingdom, did not let him return home, and then he starts prospering. Now he's a military officer, right? And you kind of see these steps happening for David, and all of this happened after he was anointed as king. After he was anointed to be the king of Israel, all this happened after. So many times in our life, we think, man, we've got to get there. Oh, I've got to to get that degree so I can get that good job, so I can then move up. Then I can do what God's called me to do. Then I can fulfill the anointing on my life. No, God's called you now, wherever you are, wherever you're going, wherever it is that you think you're supposed to do, God has anointed you now to get there. That's what's going to take you to fulfill that purpose on your life. It happened after he was anointed as king. You see, there's a lot of people in this world that need to start walking in their anointing. Think about if every person in our country, every person in this world was walking in their anointing that God had on their life. Think about what the world would look like. Think about uh, what our country would look like right now if every single person was walking in that anointing. If everyone had bowed and was obedient to what God had called them to. Man, it would be a a totally different world, don't you think? It would look way different than it does today. You see, you are called to make an impact for the kingdom of God now as you prepare for your life's purpose, whatever it is next for you. We've never made it, right? There's always something more. There's always something deeper. And I believe God has called us now as we prepare for whatever's next, as now as we continue with what God's calling us to. See, your anointing, it doesn't wait for you to be prepared. It's what prepares you. I love that. If you're taking notes, I want you to write that down. Your anointing, it doesn't wait for you to be prepared. It is what's preparing you to fulfill the call of, uh, that God's got on your life. It is what's making you that man, that woman of God that he needs for his kingdom. That anointing on your life, man, you've got to walk in that. You've got to walk in that obedience. You've got to walk in whatever it is that God's called you to now. You can never grow yourself. Only God can grow you. Only God can make you into that person that he wants you to be. Amen? So we see here that David's taking uh, the necessary steps. We see he's taking these necessary steps in fulfilling his life, to fulfilling the purpose, which is becoming the king of Israel, right? We already know that. And he's taking these steps to get there. 
See, your relationship with Christ, the anointing on your life, it's got to be the most important thing in your life. It's got to be the most important thing in your life above relationships, above school, above work, above money, above family, whatever it is, that, that call, that relationship with the Lord and the call, what he made you for, what he created you for, it is the most important thing in our life. It's got to be our number one thing. Whatever God created me to do, that's what I want to do above everything else. Whatever he is anointing me to do, that's what I want to do above anything else in this world. And it says that David won favor with the people in the kingdom. I love that, that David won favor with the people of the kingdom. It says they begin to chant his name, begin to sing his praises, how, how great David was. Luke chapter 2, verses 52, it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I love that, that he increased in favor with God and man. Can I be honest? In my life growing up, I've seen uh, most Christians, a lot of Christians, not have favor with man. And often I think we, we, we get confused on that, that, oh, well, we're not of this world. We're not supposed to be of this world. We're not supposed to be. But Jesus had favor with man. Men, thousands followed him. Thousands looked to him. Thousands gleaned to him. People followed him all over. We know that at one time, 5,000 men followed him, right? We love saying he fed the 5,000. I believe he fed close to 15,000 because 5,000 men followed him. If you add the women, if, if every man there has a, has a woman and then kids and two kids, three kids, I mean, it's up to the tens of thousands of people that followed him. Jesus found favor with man. We're not made to be of this world, but man, we are made to be in this world. We are made to be with these people who maybe not believe what we do, to have favor with them, to be in relationship with them, right? Jesus did it. We see here that David finds favor with the people of the kingdom. We see that he finds favor with the people and they love him. See, God will give you favor to make that impact now. God's gonna give you favor wherever you are. Man, if you don't love your job, if you don't love it because maybe you feel like you're not in a Christian environment, God's going to give you favor in that environment. Jesus was in the opposite of a Christian environment. Jesus was in the opposite of the environment that he, that he was called to. But, man, he found favor with people. He found favor wherever he went, wherever he walked. Man, people loved and adored Jesus. David, people found favor and they loved and they adored David. See, your purpose, man... That people want that. People want purpose. People, if they see that anointing on your life, they they there's something. They just know there's something there that they want. Even if they 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 don't know. Even if they don't want it, Jesus, they know they want something that you have. Amen. You see, if right now, and I'm not done, but if right now I said, okay, we're done today. You know, that was good. You know, probably like, yeah. That was, that was good, yeah, David's great. We all want to be like David, right? And if I asked that, we'd probably be like, yeah, I want to be like David. I want to prosper. You know, it's a great story from, you know, rags to riches. I'm sure there was a nice bonus as a military officer compared to a shepherd, right? Being your father's shepherd, I'm sure it came with a fat bonus. Um, and we're all like, yeah, we receive it. Um, and, right, if we asked that, we'd probably be good. You know, if, if I turn this into, uh, took out like scripture, took out things, um, in here and made it a, just a story, right? Took out David's name, changed his name, basically said the same thing, and this was a room full of unbelievers. And I said, now, who wants to be like this guy? You know, hands would probably go up everywhere. You know, the world that they want, they, they don't realize it, but they want to be what God's called them to be, and they don't even realize it. They want to be like somebody like King David, and they don't even know it. So as I was reading this, and as I was just kind of putting this together, as I was studying David, I was like, man, what, uh, so what's different? If everybody would like to be like this man that was after God's own heart, he is known for the man after God's own heart. If everybody would like to be like that, then what's separating us from them or followers of Christ from unbelievers? What, what is it? What how did things, you know, kind of come together for David? You know, many just needed Jonathan. Many people out there, they're, they're begging. They're looking for someone like Jonathan, right? And as Christians, we hear David. We hear stories of David. David's like every, I think every guy's like, 
I want to be like David growing up. You know, if you grew up in church my whole life, I was like, yeah, David, like that was kind of who, you know, it was Jesus. So obviously we want to be like Jesus. And then it's like, I want to be like David, a, a warrior for Christ who never lost a battle and all of these things. But as I've gotten older, I've realized, man, I want to be like a Jonathan. David's great, but I want to be a Jonathan. Jonathan, he's not mentioned much besides right here. It talks about a little bit after, but Jonathan, he dies in battle um, as, at a young age, so he's not mentioned this big role in the Bible, but I believe he had a, a bigger role than what we often look at, right? People need someone to love them like a brother, love them like a sister, love them and be in relationship with them and truly care about them. People need that. People in this world, if you don't think they're dying for that, if you don't think they're hungry for that, thirsting for that, they are looking now more than ever for someone just to love them. That's why we accept everything in this culture, right? That's why everything's accepted. That's why we don't, we don't mind whatever it is that you have. Oh, it's fine. You know, we can live however. That's why, because they're just begging to be loved. They're begging to be adored. They're begging begging to have something that more than just what this world can give them. And so they continue just to look deeper into this world. Can I tell you, the answer is what we have. The answer, we have that answer. You see, some, they're looking for someone to tie themselves to them and not let go. To tie themselves to them and never let go. A bond that can't be broken. A bond that loves them through anything. A bond that's not threatened by them. A bond that's not threatened. Can I tell you, I'm not threatened by this world. I'm not threatened by uh, the politics. I'm not threatened by the bad things. I'm not freaking out because everything looks bad. No, man, we've been preaching this for too long to freak out. We've already won. There's no reason to worry. There's no reason to fret. There's no reason to get on Facebook and talk about how bad the world is. Obviously, the Bible has said it's going to look crazy. It's going to look bad, but I've already won. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to win again. It's already been done. It was 2,000 years ago. It was already done. They need someone that will tie themselves to them and not let go. I love this. And as I, as I was just praying, the Lord just began just to continue to speak to me. But Jonathan, he was the heir to the throne. Jonathan was the, the firstborn of the house of Saul. He was next in line to be king. So whenever you look at that and you see these women, they're dancing, they're singing, all oh, Saul's killed his thousands, who should they be saying next? Should be Jonathan, our next king. Oh, Jonathan, we're praising Jonathan. We're, we're, no, but they started singing David. You see, although Jonathan, he didn't know that David had been anointed. It wasn't a thing that people knew. It was just kind of David, his house, his, his, his father's house, and uh, that kind of all that knew. It wasn't a known thing that David was anointed to be the next king. Jonathan didn't know, but he saw him quickly rising in the ranks. Overnight, he went from a shepherd boy that showed up with a sling, killed a giant, accepted into the kingdom, praised, and became a military officer, and everyone's singing his name. Jonathan didn't know he was in line to be the next king, but... He saw him rise in the ranks. This story could switch and be like, and then Jonathan got really upset. Jonathan got really jealous. And we would all understand that, right? We'd be like, yep, makes sense. But I love what Jonathan does. He, he had every right to resent David. He had every right to feel threatened by David. To look at David and be like, I don't know who you think you are showing up. My father's praising you. Everyone's praising you. I'm the next king, right? But he doesn't do that. He doesn't feel threatened. You see, sometimes we resent the people in this world, and that's why they resent our Father. We resent them because they don't agree with us. We resent them because they don't love like us. We resent them because they don't believe like us. And then we wonder why. Oh, you, you just need to turn to the Father. Well, they don't want to because you don't love them. They don't want to because you haven't bonded with them. They don't want to because you haven't made that connection. You haven't tied yourself to them. You haven't let them know the love of Jesus. That's why they resent our father, because we have resented people of this world. But instead, I love what Jonathan does. He chooses to equip David. Instead of resenting him, he equips David. He saw potential in David and knew he had a great anointing, knew he had a great purpose on his life. And instead of resenting him, he said, there's a purpose in you. There's an anointing on your life. There's something inside of you that God wants to pull out. And I'm going to help that happen. I'm going to help that come out. I'm going to apply myself to you. Why? Because I see what God sees in you. I have the heart of the father. I have the heart of the king. And I'm going to pull that out of you. Why? 
love because I know you can help my father's house. I know you can help the kingdom my father has built. I know you can do great things for the kingdom of my father. And Jonathan sees that and he begins to mold David to be a military officer, to be, uh, to fulfill that purpose in his life. Jonathan was the heir to the throne, but he saw David the way God saw David. See, if we won't change, we have to see the potential in people before we see flaws. It would have been easy for Jonathan to be like, who is this biggity little punk coming in here, taking what's mine, trying to overthrow what's mine, trying to take what's mine. No, this is mine. This. But Jonathan didn't do that. He saw potential before he saw David's flaws. And what does he do? I love this. This is such a beautiful imagery. Since he gave him his armor, and I begin to think about that. And so easy. This is just seven verses. It's so easy to read those seven verses. Like, okay, cool. He gave him some stuff. But, but what was Jonathan, right? The heir to the throne. He was the son, firstborn, of the king. You see, a king's son doesn't pay for anything. A king's son doesn't go out in the field and work and have to buy a bow doesn't have to buy a sword, doesn't have to buy an armor, doesn't have to buy a pretty robe, right? The king's son, he gets those things without having to pay for them. He didn't have to buy the armor, but his father, the king, had the best of the best made for Jonathan. The kings, they, they would call in the best uh, the iron workers, they would call in the best uh, men to come in and, and custom fit these armor plates to, 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 to Jonathan and to their military officers, to the, to the leaders. They would have these things fit just for them. They would have a sword made just for them with the right weight, a bow made for them perfectly in tune, perfectly the, the right pull bag, the right draw for them. They would perfectly make this for their son. See, he didn't have to pay for it. The king had the best of the best made for him. You didn't have to purchase anything. Our king, our father paid it all. We didn't have to buy a thing. We get to live the best life there's ever been to live, not just later, but here on this earth. And then we get to spend eternity in his presence, eternity in mansions with, with, with streets of gold and angels singing all the time. And we get to spend eternity, and we didn't have to pay for any of it because it was bought for us. We didn't have to pay anything. The Father made the best of the best for you and I. He created the best for us. And what does Jonathan do? Mm. He gave him the father's armor. He gave David the armor of his father, of the king. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 18, and this is the NLT. It says, therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, put on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all, all of these, hold up a shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. We've got to show them truth. We've got to show them righteousness. We've got to show them what peace looks like, what faith is, what salvation and sanctification is, and living by the word of God. We have to show them the armor of, the, of our God. We've got to show them the armor of the king, of the father that was customly made perfect for us, that is the best armor in all of the land, that is the best sword in all of the land that can't be beat, the best shield that can't be pierced. We have to show them the armor of our king, of our father. It is time for believers to begin equipping people with the Father's armor, to begin equipping them with the Father's love, to be equipping them with the Father's faith, with the Father's shield, with the Father's sword. We have to equip them with that. So how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we give them the Father's armor? Two things. One, you've got to wear it yourself. We've got to wear it ourselves. We have to wear truth. 
We have to walk in truth. We have to wear righteousness. We have to be obedient to what the word says. We have to live in peace and not worry in these last days. Oh, it may get crazy, but the church will rise. People will come to know him. Every tongue, every tribe will bow. It's not, it's not maybe. It's not if we do right. No, no, no. God said it will happen. The tribes will bow. The tongues will confess. We have to walk in that in peace in these last days. And faith, though, and hey, it may get tough, but my God's tougher. And salvation saying I've been saved and I've been sanctified. My God paid it all for me and I'm walking that every day in my life. And we have to live by the word of God. We have to wear this ourselves. No one's going to listen if we don't do it ourselves. And then by two, knitting ourselves to them, forming a bond and not letting go. Forming a connection and not letting go. I love this quote by Jenny Mayo. Jenny Mayo, if you don't know her, she's like a youth pastor, guru. Um, she's been around a long time, wrote a lot of youth ministry books, things like that. Um, but this is, this is her number one quote, what she lives by. And I love this. It says, I'd rather love someone to Christ than preach them to Christ. She's preached many sermons, thousands of sermons, wrote thousands of books, but her number one goal in life is to love people to Christ. When we think about Jesus, he didn't just show up to the 12 disciples and say, you got to get right. You've got to. What did he do? He said, hey, throw that net on the other side. He made a connection with them before he ever preached to them. He bonded himself with them. He made them want, want love with him. He made them want connection, want relationship with him. Way before he ever looked at them and said, Peter, you got to fix yourself, man. You're crazy. You're angry. And you just do things without thinking. He made a connection and said, man, I love you. Throw that net on the other side and watch what happens. He made a bond, a connection with them before he ever preached to them. And I believe in these last days we have to make a connection. We have to make a bond with people. We have to love people to Christ because we've preached it for a while, but it's time to love now more than ever. It is, it, it is getting there. I know we keep saying that, but it is so important. Man, I don't want to just go to heaven. I want to drag people with me. I want to bring them with me. Man, they deserve it just as much as I do. As Paul said, I'm the worst of these. Man, if I deserve it, they deserve it. I love this because Jonathan is the heir to the throne, but so is David. David had been anointed as the heir to the throne, as next in line for the king. But Jonathan was born the heir to the throne. Two heirs to the same throne. And instead of fighting, instead of hating, instead of arguing, they loved each other. They equipped each other. They cared for each other. They fought together in battle. They went to war together. They weren't going to let go. They weren't going to let the enemy come in between them. Not even Saul himself could come in between them. Nothing was going to break them. Nothing was going to come in between. They were knit together and they were not going to let go. From one heir to another. That is so special. And people in this world that, that may not believe what we believe, people in this world that may not live the way we believe they should live, they have every right to this throne as I do. They have every right to this love that I've discovered. They have every right to the miracles that I've seen happen. If I deserve it, man, they deserve it. Some more than I probably do. And when I think about my life, I just want to love them. I want to show them the love of Christ. I want to equip them with all these things. But I know we have to make a connection. I know I have to make a bond. I know I have to make a, 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 something that cannot be broken. You know, I think we've, we've always heard, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And I love that statement. I think it's a great statement because... I think the people you glean to, the people you lean on, you will be like them. And I have friends in my life, other young pastors, I have mentors in my life, older ministers of the gospel that I glean to, that I look to, that I lean on. 
but I also have friends that I might not lean on them, but I know I'm still connected. I'm still got a bond with them, that I love them, that I, I call them, that I check on them. I don't have to preach to them. I don't have to keep, all I got to do is keep loving them. All I got to do is keep encouraging them. All I got to do is keep telling them how much they're worthy, how, how much God cares about them, how much God loved them so much that they have a life, that they have armor, they have this that I have, and they don't have to pay anything for it. It's free but I have a bond with them. And I believe in the last days, and I'm done here, but I believe in these last days that revival will take place. But I don't believe that it'll look like Azuzu Street. I don't think it's gonna look like Brownsville. I believe the church will grow. The Bible says the church is gonna grow. I believe our services are just gonna get better. I believe this place is gonna be packed. I believe we're gonna be going after God like never before, but I don't believe that's what's gonna start revival. It's gonna be outside of these walls. As Jason said earlier, we gotta take it outside of these walls. I believe that's where revival is gonna start by us bonding and making a true connection with them and showing them we love you anyway. We care about you anyway. You may not believe what I believe, but this world is a world of division, but we can't be a people of division. We've got to be a people of connection, of bond, of tying ourselves to them, of loving people that don't believe the same thing we do. Because I want to encourage you, when you get to heaven, you're going to look around and be shocked at some of the people that made it, that you thought weren't going to make it. Because they didn't believe exactly what you believe, because they didn't act the way you thought they should act. But they're going to make it because someone loved them anyway. And I want to be that. I want to see people. I want to meet people. I want to love people to Christ. So today, if we could all just stand, if we could just bow our heads, I just want you to think about somebody in your life. Close your eyes, bow your heads. I just want to think, I just want you to think about somebody in your life. Maybe they don't know Christ, maybe they're not walking in their calling and their anointing, and you know that God's got more for them in their life. I just want you to think about that person for a moment. We should all have someone in our lives. So I want I want you to just think, what would it take? What would it take for them to live in the anointing that God's got on their life? What would it take for them to break down the walls the enemy's built and love him? The answer today is for us to love them, for us to connect with them, for us to bond with them, for us to love them through their flaws, love them because of their potential as Jonathan did David, because they are heir to the thrones of God. They are heir to our Father's thrones. Today I have people in my life, family members, friends that don't know the Lord, that aren't living for the Lord. But as we sang earlier, I'm believing for it. I'm believing that they're going to come to know him. And I know what I can, the only thing I can do is love. The only thing I can do is bond. The only thing I can do is truly care. Because when your heart breaks for the Father, your heart breaks for the Father's children. So today, for that person you're praying for, I just want you to leave here encouraged. I want you to leave here, call them. You don't have to preach to them, don't have to mention how great church was, and just care for them. Tell them you love them. Ask them about their life. Even if you don't agree with it, ask them about their life. Ask them about the things that they're living in, the things that they're doing, their work, their job, whatever it is, their family, and love them. I just want to pray for all of those people that we're thinking of right now. Father, for every person in this room, God, I thank you for them. God, I thank you that you have a great anointing on their life as you had on David, but I thank you that you've called them to be a Jonathan as well, that you've called them to bond with someone, God, who doesn't believe in you, who doesn't know you, and see the potential in them and equip them with your love, equip them with your armor. God, I pray that those people, God, that we're believing for, that they are going to come to know you. God, that they're going to bow to you. God, that the walls that the enemy has lied to them about and built, God, that they're going to tear down. Lord, as we sang earlier, God, they're going to be miracles. God, what we see that is impossible. It will be a miracle. It will be, uh, it will be, be something beyond what we have, God. It's just going to be you. God, it's going to be what only you can do. God, I pray for those people right now, wherever they are. God, every person in this room, God, we're representing somebody. I I pray you just begin to stir their hearts wherever they are. God, wherever they are this morning, God, whether it's at their house or at work, God, I I pray, God, they just feel your presence right now, that you just begin to stir something up in their hearts. God, you just begin to line it all up. Lord, you have a plan for their life. No mistake has ever broken that plan. Lord, use us in a mighty way 
to see people come into your kingdom, to see people fulfill the potential, the anointing on their lives. This morning, when, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you don't know the Lord, I just want to give you that opportunity before we're done. If you don't know the Lord, I want to encourage you this morning, man. This morning is your morning. It is your morning to see the love of Christ. It is your morning to change everything. And if that's you, with no one looking around, I just want you to slip your hand up real quick. Just slip it up, slip it back down. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you, God, for anyone in this room, God, who doesn't know you, God, I pray, God, they make that decision today, that today is their day of salvation. Lord, today is their day that you come into their hearts, you change everything, Lord, that they begin to fulfill the anointing that you have in their life, to fulfill the purpose you have on their life. I just pray you just come, encounter them today, move in their lives, have your way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. We pray you were blessed by the worship and ministry of our Surge experience today. It is our desire to see people experience a surge of God's power and grace that will empower them to live life beyond their limits. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for sharing the ministry of Surge Church with your friends and family and on social media. We love you and cannot wait to see you soon.